It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. This week, we're joined by Tim Plavin. Um, I'm going to let Tim introduce himself this week. because I think he, he'll tell us who he is and, and, and his background a bit better than, than uh, any of us can. So over to you, Tim. I got to get my notes. I forgot those. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I had forgotten to get my notes. Um, hi, I'm Tim Plavin, as many of you know. Um, saw right at Lee Nielsen. It was actually about 10 years ago this journey kind of began. I, um, that's a little better. I moved after my father passed away, moved back to my um, mother's and remodeled her house. While there I discovered this saw, um, Oops, I'm sorry. This saw um, my grandfather's, great grandfather's, this is number 16. I found it when we were cleaning out great grandfather's barn to, um, as my grandparents moved into the farm. I asked my grandfather if I could have it, and he said yes. It sat stored away at my parents' house for basically 40 years. When I went back to remodel mom's house, I discovered it and a few others and wanted to use it. So I looked around for sharpeners. Luckily, I didn't know that Pete Terran was on the east side of Cleveland, about an hour away from me then. Um, otherwise, I would have had him do it. Instead, I used his stuff, Matt Cianci's blog, um, Blackburn Tools, uh, Two Lawyers Tool Works, anything I could read, I read. And when I moved back to Maine in 2016, I saw an advertisement for Lee Nielsen hiring. I was thinking I would work in the wood shop. At the end of my call with the operations manager, I mentioned that I sharpened saws and he said, bring some. I said, okay. Five minutes into my interview, Tom, is comes in, says hi, and starts looking at my saws. And needless to say, I almost crap my pants, but um, he hired me, gave me the tour of the saw shop, and the rest is pretty much history. Pretty much been the happiest I've ever been professionally, so. He's great to work for, fun company. Um, and I discovered when I started working there that I really didn't know how to sharpen all that well. I went to basically went to grad school for saw sharpening. And that's pretty much my story. And introduction and well, about the chat, so I'm gonna go over basically metal work. You're all woodworkers, handles are wood and should be pretty easy. Personally, I don't like to clean or I'll clean handles, but I don't like to refinish. I like everything on there. In fact, this is a, a Patterson it is my dovetail saw, and 
the handle fits me great. All I did was clean it. And that's all I plan on doing with it. So it'll be cleaning and sharpening for my talk. And so, oh, let me, I don't think, I don't think the cleaning picture made it in. Okay. I'll stop the share. Um, so basically for cleaning, what I do is um, I use Matt Cianci and Bob Page's method. You can find both of those online, Bob Page has it in the file section of the SAWS group. And if you Google the SAW blog, um, or you can ask me and I'll, sh give, I'll share the link with you. Um, it's basically just scraping the saw down with, um, with a razor blade, round it off the edges, and then I'll go through different grits of sandpaper with simple green and scrub the saw. And then and then work my way up the grits. I basically go to 400 and then I'll switch to the Sandflex blocks that Lee Nielsen sells in coarse and medium on old tools and then fine on newer, shinier plates. And it, it really is just a simple process of just scrubbing the saw down, making, making sure that you're scrubbing with the grain of the metal, um, flipping it over and doing the other side. When, um, Thanks, Rusty. Um, when going over the edge, I'll go to 400 or 600 grit on a block and very lightly start scrubbing down and you'll, you get, you get a little feel for it. It's, it's, it's like anything else in woodworking where you get that feel for what you're uncovering and how deep and strong the etch is. And you just keep going until you're happy with it. Um, and then after that, I'll rinse the saw off really well. I'll, a lot of times I'll have the oven turned on to like 150 and then turn it off and I'll toss it in for a few minutes just to kind of dry it. Um, I've heard people using hair dryers and then I'll take it out and I'll wax it, depending on what I'm going to do with it. Generally, I'll wax it and then let it dry and put the handle back on and throw it in the vise and sharpen it. So once we're there, once we're at the, the, um, Tim, press pause. Yeah. Yeah, and use the arrow keys on your keyboard just to flick through the pictures. There we go. There you okay. Go. So this is um, a back saw that I just did and sold for Lanny Wiley, one of my coworkers. Um, this was the tooth line when I began. Um, at, this is pretty bad. Not the worst, but pretty bad. Um, and what I'll do is I'll joint it. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. I'll joint it down. And from here, I'll go through and do one pass in to basically even out the gullets. So I'll look and you can see in, in this picture how the gullets are uneven. Um, and I'll go down and even out all of the gullets and sort of begin to shape the teeth. After they are, the gullets are evened out, I'll go down and I'll joint it down as far, really as far as I need to. A lot of times there'll be, you know, a little slit left on the teeth, you know, of a gullet left on the teeth. Some are a little deeper. There's not really any slits on these. Get. I don't think I have quite all the pictures I wanted. And evidently I do. Okay. Should be in there. Um, So you can you can still yep. use the arrow keys. It's easier for you. There we go. Okay. Okay. So after joint again. Is, okay. So basically, I'm going to start reshaping, and you can see the. The teeth on the right side are already done. The teeth in the middle, I'm just beginning on. And what I'll do is I'll take five, basically a group of five or 10 teeth and begin to shape those. You can see the thicker, um, flat. So in this case, you see the arrow trick or the yeah. cursor? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, I'm going to, as I go into this tooth, I'm going to press into this tooth right here because it's the thicker of the two. Um, and it's all about feel and all about, you know, you're being able to press into that and stopping, I'll do, I'll do one file pass and then stop and look at it, do another file pass until it's almost, you can see this tooth has just a little flat on it. So, and that's where I'll stop. And I'll just work my way down in those groups of five because it's easy, to, it's easier to look at that balance. If you're only working in five, if you start looking all the way down the saw, you start to get carried away. And it's, you lose focus on what's going on. So I'll work those five down. Okay, and there you can see, in this pass, I took these pictures or I tried to take these pictures at the same angle. So I'm, these are basically done. You've got 
this is the end where I'm gonna begin again. So one more pass through these, this one will take two, this one will take two, this one will take two, but one more pass through this will take care of these. And then they'll all be lined up and ready to go. And more of a more of a front-on view, you can see the flats and you can see the gullet depths, how everything kind of lines up. And that's another thing that you're going for. And you know, if if you have a for example, this tube, this gullet is deeper than its neighbors. So when I put the file in there, what I'm gonna do is concentrate to not drop the file all the way in the gullet and go side to side or very lightly drop the file into the gullet. And again, it's, it's one of those Charlie and I were just joking about watching the video. It's it's one of those skills you have to do. Um, so when the saw is at this point where I've eliminated the flats all the way down and I'll look down the saw, basically, um, basically, sight down the saw line and you can see it and you can and if you run your finger down you can feel the high teeth if i feel any high teeth i'll go in and take them down and then since i have the saw teeth all the way i want them i'll go in and i'll just set set it and then make one final sharpening pass and it's done. For a rip saw, for the crosscut saw, I'll set it and then go in and add the fleam. Oh, I forgot to add that um, when I'm reshaping a tooth line, the only thing I'm concentrating on is the shape of the teeth and um, their spacing and the rake angle. I'm not adding fleam or anything else. It's just one more complication that you don't need at that point. So, uh, flats disappear. Yep. And then, in the case of the crosscut saw, once I set it, then I'll go back in, and it usually takes three passes, four passes. Um, when I sharpen crosscut with a saw with great teeth, I will just do one pat, one full pass down with one stroke of the file down the entire length, flip it, do another full pass down the other side, flip it, do another full pass until it's sharp. And that's basically it. So that's my process. So now I will just open it up to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Thanks for mm -hmm. thanks for a brilliant talk. Uh, we this week we've had an unusual week. We actually had a question. Uh, someone popped their name in the chat before the talk even started. Um, so those of you who haven't joined us before, if you want to ask a question, if you put your name in the chat uh, and I'll ask you to unmute and ask uh, Tim your, the question yourself. So uh, Paul decided to get in nice and early. <laughs> so uh, Paul, would you like Hi, to Tim. ask Tim a question? Thanks for an absolutely amazing talk. Just out of interest, Thank you. Uh, whose files do you actually use? I, I have, I, in fact, I just did that this morning because I got a shipment from karate. Um, but I have, I use everything from big box store Nicholson's in the green package to, 
I have some tomes, I have some gardens, I have, but right now the only thing I'm gonna buy is karate's because they are basically head and shoulders above the competition. They last so much longer and their shape is so great. I just bought one of their new, I think they're their new gold files. Um, and I didn't quite get the length I wanted, but that's all right. It'll be for smaller saws and looking at the, looking at the edges, they were just, I was amazed at how tight they were. So, and the karate is last. I mean, we at work will get, um, we generally, we work the saws up with machines to basically, hopefully we have one pass with hand filing and then they're done. Well, with the karate's, we can basically get one or eight saws out of one edge. So, and that's never happened before. Okay. So I, yep, started using karate's and won't go back. Thanks very much. I'll let somebody else ask a question. Okay. All right. Cheers. Thanks, Paul, for getting in nice and early. Uh, <laughs> Matthias, unfortunately, you got beaten this week. But over to you this week for number two. Yeah, that's all right. I can live with that. I'll, I'll get my own back with Paul next week or the week after. Anyway, no, sorry, that that, that was being silly. Uh, thank you ever so much, Tim. Uh, fascinating talk indeed, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to ask, you didn't mention... Uh, what method do you use for setting the teeth? And do you have what, what's your thoughts on plier setting versus hammer setting? I use pliers. Um, I use 42X for everything below um, 12 point and below. Yep. And I actually have a 42W. So my 42X. And the 42W, you can see the difference in the, this is an adjustable piece and it locks against the blade yep. and sets your angle so that you can only go so far. And as long as you use it correctly, it's as good as the 42X. I just, I just have them, I have two of them set up for basically those those teeth yeah um that's the easier way i found to do it with those yeah. and yes i'd like to get uh my boss has a tom has a uh a distant star set that yeah. i actually bought for him and i kind of kicked myself mm -hmm. um but basically a few of the machinists of i at work have talked about copying it at least for me to use. Yeah. I like the foot pedal on the on the star set. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I did two years ago, I did uh, the saw sharpening course with Mark Harrell. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and he swears by hammer setting. Right. Yeah. And uh, he, so, so we enough got that by he... both the, the star set and also the old uh, uh, the old, I, I forget the name, but the basically the 19th oh, century yes. that, you, that you hit yourself with a hammer on the top. Yep. And that was, uh, I found that, it, it, exactly, it t took a little, took some getting used to, but once you knew that you shouldn't give it too much of a wallop, it was a very nice way of getting a fairly coherent tooth line, I found. Right. Yeah. And and again, it's it's a matter of setups. Yeah, you know, people people ask, and it's and it's actually the most important most important tool in setting a saw are yeah. those. Yes. Yeah. Knowing and, how um, much you measure or Mark, how much Mark, you're Mark, setting. Uh, Mark uh, if I may, if you allow the pun, he hammered home that point very 
uh, very carefully. And once you've set it, you have to go over it and you may need to stone it a couple of times very carefully to get it to so that it's uh, perfectly even all the way. Right, and, and I don't, um, I stone after I, I'll do all the reshaping from one side. So I'm gonna leave a burr on the other side. Yeah. My sharpening passes generally don't leave burrs. Um, it was drilled into my head that you have you your sharpening pass is light. Yeah. So you shouldn't be leaving a burr. Or that little bit of a burr that you're gonna leave is gonna come off during a during your first test cut. Yeah. So so by measuring, I put you know, on crosscut saws, I'll generally go up to two thousandths of an inch more per side, or no, two thousand an inch total. Yeah. Over the set I want for the for the final sharpening process to take it out. Mm -hmm. But I I've got them dialed in well enough that I don't need to stone. Oh. Um, and I don't like to stone because when you stone, if you don't have a burr, you're actually taking metal off. Yeah. So I'd rather the teeth stay a little bit thicker. Mm -hmm. See what you mean. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll uh, let the next one get in with that question, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, over to when I can find him, Jim. Yeah. Hey, thank Tim. you very much, Jim, for, uh, for inviting Tim to do this talk. No, I mean, it was br brilliant because Tim's, Tim and I have been talking about this for ages and I was so thrilled looking at the number of people that have come on to watch you that we haven't had before. And, uh, that, you know, that's always refreshing. Uh, it's wonderful to have a new uh, audience of fans of yours, which I know there are many in, in the States. And uh, I have to admit, I, I, I don't... It doesn't matter how much you try and teach me, I'm never going to sharpen my own saws. I'm, 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 I'm not going to do that. That's my... That's my that's my promise to the world. I'm going to leave that up to Shane, but you know that. So, but the, as, the interesting as thing. Recall, huh? No, as I, I recall, Shane tried to teach you and yeah, you gave I, up. I, no, I didn't give up. He said to me, he said to me, Jim, I'll teach you. Come up and I'll teach you in Scarborough. And I said to him, no, I'll send you the source. You can do it and send them back to me. Because <laughs> I mean, have you seen some of the, t I mean, you know, the 18, 20 TPI, oh, no. Yeah, no way, no way. But my, my question was going to be about files, a bit of a obviously leading question, because I know having spoken to you about karate on many occasions that you, you received the package. I saw your post on the, on the package and I'm, I'm really jealous about the sticker. I shall have to have a word with Federico about that because I don't oh, yeah. get stick. Yeah. <laughs> but the, um, a question I was going to ask you on the on the karate files, which we we now, have, you know, we know that they are uh, excellent files. And in fact, uh, having spoken to Federico about uh, Groblave of Valor Bay ones, he, he, they actually supply them for for Valor Bay um, in the states now, I believe. So um, you're mm -hmm. just paying you're just paying over the odds for karate ones when you buy uh, American uh, Valor Bay. Um, but what I was going to ask yeah. you about, did you get the, um, did he send you or did you order one of the uh, double-sided safe uh, three square tri uh, uh, files, which are uh, for the floats? No, I didn't see those. And then again, I really didn't look. I, on, I got the notify, I got an email about the sale on Friday and I went, well, I'm going to stock up. Yeah. Um, I've kind of been meeting, meaning to, I needed some needle files and I just went through. It was Friday was a hectic day. We had to, we ended up driving down. Um, I basically drove like 250 miles. So we were gone all day. So I did it really quick in the morning and the gold needle file was the only one that I happened to see that was newer and I just snagged one. Okay, if you go on but to no, the, the if you go on to the float section, 
it, it, it go on to the um, uh, I think it's under I think it's under chisels actually, but anyway, specialized chisel floats or specialized files floats. I think um, in right. that section there's a file that you use for float sharpening, which has to have two safe edges. And um, it was a bit of a eureka moment for me. So I thought tonight I'd, I'd pass the tip on in public so other people get aware of it. But it's got just one cutting single cut edge. Um, and when mm -hmm. you're trying to touch up floats or saws or anything that you, you don't want anything around it to be, um, you know, filed at the same time, it is absolutely, well, and it's uh, 100, 150 mil. So it's a perfect length as well. And it's absolutely an right. amazing file. And, you know, with floats, yes, that's one thing. But with, to me, with saws, it's always, it's you're bringing together those. Those two sides, yep. You know, you're sharpening two, you're sharpening two edges. And, um, and you're really shaping those two edges. So I want that, I want both of those, both of those surfaces to be to be hit because you're flattening, you think about flattening the back of a chisel and then turning it over and putting the bevel on. You know, this way you're guaranteeing you're guaranteeing that your back of your the back of your edge is is flat. Mm -hmm. But these so. are uh, they do, I think they do also the three square. Um, exactly the same, but they're, they're on the they're all uh, under the um, iridium uh, brand. So if you look at which is the same, yeah. it's, a, it's basically a it's like the gold range, and then there's the iridium range, and but they're all made by by karate. But it's worth it's worth getting one to, to you know even the uh, three sided um, cut to to have a look because I think it might give you the length that you need, and certainly for larger saws, it will give you the uh, the size that you need, um, you know. So, yeah. you know, have a look at this. Anyway, absolutely fantastic. Um, I, a million questions I could ask, but I'm I'm not going to monopolize you tonight. So, having going, and I can always ask you questions anyway, like normal. So, uh, thanks for coming on, you know Tim. It's much appreciated, sir. Thanks. It's nice meeting you finally. Cheers. Thank you very much, Jim. Over to Eric. Hi Tim, thanks very much. That was a, a, an amazing talk, and like all experts, it makes me think I could have a go at that. And this is something I've thought for a few years, and so I bought myself a saw to learn how to sharpen on. And this thing, it's got there you go. lots, of, lots of teeth. It's, and it's got a nice weight to it. It's quite a nice, quite a, a pleasant saw to use, I think. Uh, but some of the teeth has been it's been much sharpened and abused and some of the teeth are almost disappeared they're really really tiny and it's got a sort of belly right. in it so my thoughts are if i flatten it some of these teeth are going to completely vanish and it's also got a broken tooth so i need to go down quite far so how do you put them back in or do you just decide how many tpi you want and go from there well you can you can do it Either way, actually, you can flatten it off totally and then go back and cut new teeth in um, all the way down. Uh, that sounds like school way over on me. <laughs> well, yes and no. It's just a matter of practice. Um, or you can, you can join it down so you have those gullets still. You can still see the gullets and then do a couple of passes down the saw. So you're deepening the gullets uh -huh. and then join it down again and then deepen the gullets again until you joint it down and you put a straight edge on the saw and you have, you have one plane. Uh -huh. You have a nice even point. So, and then you go back in and just like I said, you reshape all the teeth at that point you know again and you'll just concentrate on your rake and the spacing of the teeth and you'll be fine but if you wanted to take them all off and use the template from i use template from blackburn tools um nice. it's 
really just rolling. It's a paper paper template. I'll tape it over the take tape it over the saw so it's nice and tight, and it'll have all this, the spacing lines on it. I'll take a. Ooh, I get to show off my new my new tool. Let's see if I can do that. <laughs> No, nope, can't quite. Can you see? I'll just take the so the triangular file. I'll lay it flat and roll it into onto the line, and then make a pass. Mm -hmm. And then while it's there, I'll make another pass, and then I'll move on to the next. And that's it. And then if you get two passes into a saw, you'll be able to, um, you'll, you'll have all of those evenly spaced gullets. And then it's just a matter of continual passes down the saw until you have your teeth, until you eliminate all the flaps yeah. that you created. And, one of the, and I didn't mention it in the talk, it, and for those who follow me on Instagram and, and Facebook, it's, I call it chasing the flats hmm. because I'm chasing the flats all the way down the salt and eliminate, eliminating them. All right. So, so you yeah. really want to do it. And the big thing is, you know, with that one and not having, you know, with that one, I'd probably just wipe them off and start over. But for mm -hmm. you, one of one of the things that you can do is is reshape those teeth all the way down, join it, mm -hmm. reshape it until you get rid of that bow, until you have a nice level cutting surface. And by the time you're done reshaping it, you'll have all the practice you need to sharpen salt. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Tim. No, that, that, that sounds that sounds great. I, I, I'm I, inspired to to have a go. So fingers crossed. <laughs> thanks very okay. much indeed. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna right. drink a beer. All right, sure. While you do that, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Phil. Right. I can you find Phil. There he is. For Tim's got his beer open. Is it okay? Concentrate. I'll let you finish that. Concentrate. We don't want to get too much head. I used to. I used to be a restaurant manager. I can pour them in my sleep. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, you should have said I would have fired away. Right. Um, a little bit like Eric, I've sharpened some saws. I've restored a couple. The restorations mm -hmm. are a bit ho hum. So, yeah, I, I agree absolutely with that point about reshaping teeth jointing reshape so i've got that that's good questions for you as a as a user as a person trying to get this done i noticed i think you are shaping and sharpening from back to front is yes yeah you, and you are you would advocate that you you're sold on that that's the I do. that's the way i learn you know and on occasion when i'm shaping i'll jump around but I've always I've always worked back to front, and if you think about it, um, we're we're operating Western saws on a push, so that that leading edge, you want that nice and flat. The leading edge of the tooth, you want nice and flat. Here's a nice big one. So. This is the this is the cutting edge. So this you want nice and flat and sharp. This one isn't currently. Um, but so by working working that edge all the way down, you you're guarantee working from the heel to the toe, you're guaranteeing that you're working on the leading cutting edge of yeah, okay. of the yeah. saw just right. like when you sharpen a chisel you're sharpening the bevel 
and you've already had your back, the back of the chisel flat. So you're creating that yeah, yeah, cutting yeah. edge. Yeah, yeah, I'll take that, yes. And I've, I've read other things about it vibrates less on the sharpening yeah. stroke there, yeah. I've seen both. If you're doing it that way, yeah, that's a good recommendation for me, certainly. Could I follow that with a slightly related question? In terms of the amount of shaping you're doing, I'm interested you're talking about getting eight saws out of one file. Are you ever shaping with slightly older files and saving your the new edge for the final sharpening? Do you make well, use of your files like uh, that? Okay, the eight the eight saws out of one out of one edge was at work. Sure. When all the teeth are shaped and there's one sharpening pass through them. So they're basically, I mean, they'll cut. Yeah. They won't cut to our standards. So we go through and um, put one final pass on them. And that's the eight. Mm -hmm. What I do at home is I'll use a new edge for a sharpening pass. Yeah. For several sharpening passes. And then when I feel it's degrading a little bit, I'm not quite getting the sharp that I want, I will start using that edge to reshape old saws. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So I'll basically use an old edge to reshape. Got it. That's what I was thinking. Maybe if, if that's a good thing, I will stick with that. I'm not too cheap to buy new files, and but I'd like to make use of them. Right. And then basically when it's, when you're no longer cutting the gullet, you know, that, that thin arise yep. is an edge and it's cut like the rest of the file, but it just wears out quicker. Yep. So when I'm no longer and the file will actually start skating through the metal, it won't cut, it'll skate and slide across the metal. When it starts doing that, then I, go to another edge. That edge is done. Good. Yeah. No, that's good sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With that, that's me. I've had my two questions. Right. That's enough to move on. Thank you very much, you. Phil. Uh, over to you, Scott. Evening, Tim. That was a brilliant talk. Thank you. Um, my question is slightly different. Um, that's not unusual for me. Um, so you said that you started working at Nielsen 10 years ago, and that's when you started saw sharpening. So my question uh, is, what's your experience before that? It was five years ago that I started working at Lee Nielsen. Right. Um, it was 10 years ago. It was basically nine years ago is when I started woodworking um, and discovered hand tools. Uh, that's when I met um, Jimmy and several other people on unplugged woodworking. Yep. Um, and that's when I started sharpening on my own. Um, it wasn't until 2016 that I moved back to Maine and uh, went to a Lee Nielsen open house and showed a saw to Matt Cianti and Isaac Smith from Blackburn Tools and they had nice things to say about my sharpening. So that kind of gave me a little bit of confidence to go in and apply at Lee Nielsen. So prior to that, my degree is actually in environmental science and I worked in biotech for about six years and discovered that mm, I didn't want to be a scientist. I also spent the majority of my life in the restaurant business as a chef manager. And basically got to the point where I, I really didn't want to open my own and couldn't find anybody to work for that. It's not, it's not in the restaurant business, it's not a working for, it's a working with. The most successful I've been and most successful restaurants I've been associated with have been a team of people working together and everybody sharing that same knowledge or same um, same sense of, of business, what we want to do. And actually at Lee Nielsen, 
the, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that whenever I want to see Tom, I just walk upstairs and he's, he's the, the type of person that I would have went into business with in the restaurant industry. And I would have wanted to work with because when I ask him about things, so whether it's buying new equipment, old equipment, fixing things, this and that, he's like, do you need it? Yes. Buy it. So it, and he wants the same, the same results that I want for myself at home. He wants for all of his customers. And so it's, it's nice to be able to work there like that. The one thing I'm, I'm in the same camp as Jim um, in Scotland, um, we traditionally have always used what we call saw doctors and we sent our saws round to them and they, they sharpened our saws for us. Um, yep. And that, that was always been, I was, I'm was a site joiner at the end of the day and we didn't have time to sharpen saws. Some did, I think that's more of a kind of a bench thing where people may be working on a bench, have got more time for that. But your saws went away and got sharpened. I mean, as soon as you got them, you cut more wood. Um, but the one thing that, right. um, it's not missing from your talk, but I know that I've spoke to you on Unplugged before. Well, we've chatted and Unplugged and, and comments and that. The one thing for me being mm -hmm. a user is the sound I saw makes when you get it back when it's sharp. You can tell even sometimes if, if there's one tooth and it's maybe just, if it's had a wee dink or something and even in using a saw, um, regardless of its size, you just have to listen more for the smaller teeth. Obviously you can hear them, but on any rip saw or cross cut saw even, you can still hear that noise. And it's, a, it's an amazing sound when you get it back and it's just perfect. You know, for a fact, even in a rip saw, all those little chisel cuts, you can hear them all making that noise and you pass it through and it doesn't change. The resonance is the same the whole way through the whole, the whole plate of the saw. And that to me is like, I think that's more of a user thing. I don't sharpen saws and I never have, but knowing that and hearing that, you can, you can sense it right away. No, that's actually, I use that, we use that when test cutting. You know, if my coworker is test cutting a saw and, or I'm test cutting a saw and it doesn't sound right, chances are one of us are gonna say, well, that don't sound right. So no, you're exactly right. The, the sound that the saw makes going through, going through the wood is, is part of it. Yeah, it's a big part of it. Thank you for that. I was in a good, I was a, good, a great talk. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Scott. I'm going to get myself in here and ask a couple of questions. So, Tim, uh, my first question, which we didn't talk about last night. The other question we did talk about last night, and I will ask that. But my first question is, uh, you didn't really talk much about rhythm, because when you're when you're sharpening a saw. I found at least, I found rhythm is quite key. So, you know, using the same pressure on every stroke, stroke, same length of stroke, keeping that consistency. Is that, is that well, what you agree with or? In, in, in making that sharpening pass, yes. It's, it's, um, I didn't talk about much about the sharpening paths because the majority of the work is, is in reshaping. The sharpening paths is once you get to that, I've got them all. They're all the same height. Here, this one's for Mike. Eighteen sixties, early eighteen sixties, Henry Diston. So. They're all the same height. Okay. So now when I want to put a sharpening pass on it, you're exactly right. That rhythm that you develop going through the saw, you want, you want your, you know, you're focusing on your rake angle and the pressure through, through the, of the pressure of the file through the tooth and it's light because with a brand new with a brand new file edge you let you let the file do the work you don't need to put pressure into it the file is going to cut correct yep yep 
So yeah, you develop, and that's something that that's something that you develop as you go, as you learn to sharpen. You you get that rhythm, and you go through it, and you get on sharpening passes. You you get that feel for how much pressure and lack thereof. I, I actually I started finding uh, I sharpened. I've got about fifteen saws now, and I've sharpened all of them. And over time, mm-hmm. I found myself sort of uh, realizing when when I was tipping the file in my hand and just knowing and just feeling for things and getting that rhythm in. Right. Which which you're talking about. Yeah. It's, yeah. Right. It's 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 one of those muscle memory. Exactly. Things. Yeah. Yeah. And then a, the second question, completely unrelated to this one was uh, you've talked a bit about uh, ha- uh, a back source, as you, as you call them in, in, in America, um, but tensioning a, a handsaw. Um, how would you recommend someone went, around, uh, went about tensioning a handsaw? Tensioning, tensioning a handsaw? Yeah. Not a back saw. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I haven't hammered saws because I have, I live in New England and there are plenty of old saws. In fact, I've, there was an antique shop that's open just in the summertime that I drive by on my way to work. And I only live two and a half miles from Lee Nielsen. So it's not a long drive. I pull in there and I buy saws. In fact, a number a number sixteen from that shop. Um, so I haven't had to hammer hand saws. I do plan on teaching myself. Um, Bob Smallzer has an excellent article in Wood Central, and I've talked about this with people who have hammered saws for tensioning, a little bit of kink removal, that kind of thing. Um, And his article, everybody who's done it recommends his article. And it's all about um, removing all the tension to begin with and then reapplying even tension all the way around through the saw. And so, and it's light little hammer taps, um, evenly spaced down the, down the length of the saw. Uh, Mark Harrell actually has a pretty good, I don't know if he has a video in there, if it's just stuff I've seen on on YouTube, the way he does it is exactly the way I've heard it described by the people who do do it. So, so do you? So does your colleague do the 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 tensioning of the hand saws at Lee Nielsen? We haven't tensioned. We never tensioned the hand saws at okay. Lee Nielsen. Is it, there is there a need for it in that case? Well. It depends. It depends on the metal and it depends on the process. You know, we get the metal in and then I'll tooth it. So it's getting that hammer, that even hammer all the way down the tooth line from, from the fully, fully toothers. It's fully toothers are a punch and die and they literally hammer the saw all the way down. So it's getting that. And then it's a matter of, and I'm gonna grab an easier one to flex. It's a matter of, you know, it'll have, you know, a little bit of a bow in it. And it's a matter of, you know, if a, you know, if a saw is tensioned and you can see I'm folding this in half and it snaps right back and there are no bends. This saw is tensioned. And when 
when we were doing hand saws before or panel saws before the pandemic, I mean, that's what we would do. If this had a little, a little bend in it right here, I would just simply focus my bend, focus the energy into that. And a well-tensioned saw will respond to that and, and straighten out. And after I straighten it out, I'll even put it on the bench and, you know, really focus that, that bend. And then a well-tensioned saw, as long as you're not abusing it, if you flex it a few more times, it'll snap back in and be just fine. Um, saws that have gone out of tension, again, I don't, I don't have the need to, to mess with those. So I'm, I'm sure I have a lot of older saws that are out of tension, but I haven't purchased them to use. I've purchased them to collect. So when you, when you talk about hammering, it's, it's, another of those processes that take time to learn and take time to do correctly. So I just said, no, don't do it yet. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, are you willing to take some more questions? Sure. Okay, in that case, uh, over to Paul. Hi, just a, a couple, just a couple more questions. Oh. Um, sure. First one is, when with a uh, a back saw, do you actually sort of say there's not enough left to bother sharpening it? Um, it depends on the saw, really. You know, and it depends on what you want to use it for. I bought. This saw, basically, it's, this is a, an English saw. Um, is that? I think it's an Edwin Taylor, and I bought it for the medallion. But if you look, there's not that much. This is a 14-inch saw, two 14-inch saws. So there's not that much left. To me, if I was going to make this into a user, which I love old handles and the way they fit into my hand, um, I would take the saw apart, remove the blade, and then get a new chunk of steel and, and redo it. And then it's right back into my dovetail saw, the Patterson, um, that's exactly what I did. I put a new 15th out plate in there and it's my, it's my dovetail saw. Sorry to jump in on Paul's question there, but I think this is relevant. Um, what steel do you use on the saw plates? So if you're replacing um, a saw plate, what steel would you use? Well, I, I'm fortunate and I just get it from work. Um, <laughs> I I hand Tom some money and he goes, hey, okay, whatever. The first time I did that, I wanted to buy a, a blade. And I said, I just want to buy a scrap blade to put into an old saw. And he's, he's like, okay. I'm like, well, who do I pay? He goes, you pay me. And I go, okay, how much? And he goes, a dollar. And I'm like, all right, here you go. And in fact, I think I handed him two, but if you get a spring, a quality spring steel from, I've bought steel from, and Charlie can answer this a little bit better too, from, um, I've bought from MSC. I actually just buy through work. I tell our purchasing person to buy me this and she goes, okay. And it shows up, I get a bill, I pay the controller and I'm done. Um, but if you get a quality spring steel and the thickness you want from anybody the world over, 
you're all set. The thickness and the size that you want. For example, for a 14 inch back saw, 14 inches long, four inches deep, the thickness you desire, you're okay. And then you just have to, basically what I'll, what I'll do is I'll grind the back edge or the edge that goes into the back. I'll run it along a, a grinder very gently, um, not generating a lot of heat and get a little bit of a, make sure the burrs are all off of it. And then you're just gonna tap it back into the back and go from there. So I, I'm one of those that yes, if an old saw has no point left, I have no problem putting a new blade back into it. You know, okay. think of it as an think of it as an old plane. I've had that conversation. You know, the heart of a back saw is the handle and the and the back. The blade is just like a plane blade. Good analogy. One more thing, you know that you said that your fi your files are spent, you know it's done for sharpening. Yep. Well, yep. you're not going to remember them all. How do you mark them to sort of say that edge is done? There you go. Can you see that? Yeah. Is you it, is it mark mark? Pen? Is it sharpie? Yep. Yep. Oh. Straightforward enough. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Again. All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, so we've had a question from uh, Carlo. Unfortunately, he says his, his camera doesn't work. I'm going to spotlight him, but I'll, I'll ask his question on his behalf. Um, so uh, he says that why do you make a single file pass before jointing the teeth line? And is that enough to even out the gullets? Um, I do that pass to even out the gullets and sometimes one isn't enough, but what I'll do is I'm, as I'm sharpening, um, say this was in the vise, I would just go down and as I'm shaping the teeth, the, the occasions where one pass isn't enough to even out the gullets, those, those teeth are going to have a wider flat on top and will need more work to get them down to the same height. So you're going to put in the extra pass anyway. Do you follow me? Okay. So that's basically why I just run down it, get them even or semi-even and join it down and begin filing or reshaping, I should say. All right, thank you, Carla, right. for your thank question. You. Uh, we're now moving over to Ireland with, uh, with Sean, when I can find that guy. He's unmuted himself, he's moved up the list. There we go. Here's Sean. Sure. My mic works. Hi, Sean. Yes, it is. Just speak Hi. up a bit, though, Sean. Fantastic. Sorry about that. Tim, I've been looking forward to this. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, your, you. your talk about buying spring steel for saw plates kind of put the question into my head. Um, classically, old hand saws would have a tapered saw plate, um, so that I, I believe in theory, so that it's less likely to bind in the cut. And I was wondering. Right. How important do you think that is? And is there uh, a technique to taper that's kind of within reach of a, a hobbyist? Um, unless you know a grinding shop, no. Okay. Um, I was talking more about for back saws mm -hmm. because with hand saws, um, you, know, you know, old hand saws, the handles, the holes weren't standard. Like at Lee Nielsen, we use standard punch holes. 
for all of our saws so that the handles all basically fit in there. Um, well, they all fit in there. But in the past, the saw was, excuse me, placed into the handle and then, and then the holes were drilled through the wood and the metal. So if you like an old handle and you can find a, I, for a handsaw, I wouldn't buy a new um, blade or new steel from anyone. I, when I go to flea markets, I'll offer a dealer 10 bucks for a couple of saws and he'll go 20 bucks takes them all. And I'll go, okay. <laughs> so, you know, you get those, you get those blocky 1950s handles mm -hmm. that, and 60s handles that just look terrible and are completely uncomfortable. I'll rip those off and guess what? 1950s, 1960s, 1970s steel is rather nice. Okay. So I'll then adapt that saw blade to that really nice handle. Gotcha. So that's, that's basically your advice for the hobbyists doing a, a hand saw, reuse yeah. old plates. Yep. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tim. You're welcome. Cheers, Tim. Thank you very much. I don't think we've got any more questions come, come in tonight. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for a brilliant talk. And as we do, as a bench talk tradition, raise a glass and, and say cheers to the bench. And cheers to Tim for tonight's talk. Tim on the bench. Tim on the bench. Cheers. cheers to Tim.